I want to thank the uh, conveners for the, the opportunity to present this work. Um, and as a geologist and geochemist, uh, it's been kind of a luxury to, to be immersed in um, what's uh, so far two days of plant biology. Uh, what I'm going to present today is one component of collaborative work, uh, here a list of my collaborators, um, that we're doing on, and that what I think what the main message is, is a new perspective on the uh, Earth's earliest tropical wetland forests. Uh, and we're going to argue that these uh, plants, extinct plants, were able to not only respond to climate, but that they actually probably had the ability to drive the environment. And and I'd like you to keep in mind that this work, um, I mean, most of us, there, there's quite a few paleobotanists on here, but this work is really part of a larger effort to define new plant functional types and biomes uh, for the late Paleozoic for our Earth system modeling of the climate at the time, and ultimately to get at vegetation CO2 climate feedbacks. So I'm going without it. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let me give you a little bit of uh, background first. Uh, these uh, expansive forests uh, uh, diversified and radiated throughout the um, tropics between about 325 million years ago. This is a bar to show their time period. Uh, to about 300 million years ago at what I'll refer to as the Carboniferous Permian Boundary. But what I really wanted to point out here is that these forests radiated during a time when atmosphere, shown in blue, was rising to perhaps its highest values in the uh, Earth history, and at the same time, CO2 was overall very low. Now, this uh, unique atmosphere is attributed to uh, unusual levels of terrestrial organic carbon sequestration as peats, uh, ultimately as coals, and what you see here is a compilation for North American coals at this time. It's important that uh, all coals, except for a few in Euro America, pretty much disappear at this boundary, uh, and really very rapidly. So uh, during this time of radiation of these uh, expansive forests, they underwent repeated uh, restructuring of the ecosystems. And that's shown here on this diagram as shades of green and orange. Uh, these are different wetland and seasonally dry biomes that were alternating on different time scales. And some of those examples of the, of the biomes are shown here in the top panel. This restructuring occurred uh, with quali quantitative changes in species composition major changes in vegetational architecture. Uh, as I said, these, these, uh, this restructuring occurred uh, repeatedly on the, uh, for instance, million year time scale with changes from periods of maximum gla glaciation to periods of very much retracted ice or interglacials. And for instance, on the, mid on the million year time scale, um, this shift from the typical lycopsid forest with wetland biome one into this second wetland biome that was more cordatalian lycopsid uh, mix and another couple of shifts between wetland biome two, three, three and four uh, associated with the loss of cordatalians and then the near complete loss of lycopsids here uh, at this last one. And importantly, towards the close of the Carboniferous, uh, there was a permanent shift to seasonally dry biomes like this, dominated by conifers and cordatalians, near loss of lycopsids. And this presaged the return to intense glaciation. Now, superimposed on this million year time scales were um, eccentricity, long eccentricity, 400,000 year restructuring, and those are shown here as these vertical orange bars. So I'll turn to those. Now, um, if you're familiar with this time period at all, you, you appreciate that the climate changes on these eccentricity timescales are archived in r stacks of these stratigraphic cycles called cyclothems that you're looking at here. These meter to tens of meter scale cycles um, are the fundamental unit for, this, for the late Carboniferous, or, I mean for the Carboniferous and Permian. Associated with these uh, long eccentricity climate changes were these repeated changes in the, in the um, tropical flora. And so during the glacial times, you had your typical lycopsid forests that expanded in the lowland basins uh, during the, what were very wet glacials as well. And these were replaced repeatedly at the interglacials by these seasonally dry floras, cordatalians, and conifers. And we have independent evidence that these interglacials were far more seasonally dry. 
Now, the, the impact of climate on the, the flora has been long well recognized. Um, what is less well appreciated is whether the flora had the ability to perturb the environment. And typically, it's assumed that the influence on the environment was probably limited to um, organic carbon sequestration because of the overall assumed low photosynthetic and gas exchange capacities of these tropical flora. So what we'll do today is to um, provide some, some of the uh, examples of what we're doing regarding trying to reconstruct the paleophysiology. Um, we think we can show that these were functioning on a far more dynamic range than has been assumed based on nearest living relatives. And then I'll, in the last uh, few slides, I'll um, to demonstrate, actually more than the last few slides, I'll demonstrate how we're applying some of this insight into the paleophysiology, uh, into producing an eccentricity scale multi-proxy CO2 curve for 16 million years of this ice age. Uh, looking at some of the taxonomic differences in the physiology and what it might mean perhaps for differential ecological competitiveness and influence on the hydrologic cycle. And lastly, um, we're hypothesizing a possible role for a CO2 threshold or CO2 starvation that would have worked with aridification for the demise of uh, the lepidendrils first and then the ultimate collapse of these forests at, the, at about 300 billion years ago. Okay, so for the, the uh, first set of sl uh, slides I'm going to show you is some of the approaches that we take to reconstructing the physiology based on the plant traits and morphologies. And these samples will come primarily from the Illinois basin of the mid-continent of the U.S. They are dominantly the medullosins or the seed ferns that you see here. Uh, for all the other taxa, uh, we've been really turning to the literature for uh, these plant traits, although we are now starting to do our own measurements on quite a few uh, of the plant groups. Now the first, these next six slides um, sort of give some example of these approaches. I mean, you're familiar with uh, all of these. I just want to show you sort of how they, the, the results turn out. But first of all, this is a uh, photomicrograph of one of these uh, fossil cuticles, Macroneuropterus shuxeri. And the point here is to show the excellent preservation of these cuticles. And I think you can see the, the stomatal complexes. They look like little s snowflakes on here. So the first approach is to try to get at maximum stomatal conductance, or Gmax, um, using the measured morphologies uh, and expressed quantitatively here by a well-known uh, gas exchange equation. So here's a distribution, frequency distribution, for two of the, the uh, genera of uh, these medullosins or medullosals. And if you're familiar with these at all, you'll see these values of about 800 to 2,000 um, uh, millimoles per uh, meter squared per second. These are really high values compared to what is con considered or presumed in the literature. And here I show the distribution of these uh, Gmax values. These are the green values shown by the, the different taxa of the medullosins uh, over a six million year period of time. Comparing those to the CO2 curve for that time period, that's the red dashed line with the black dots, um, what you can see is that there seems to be a relationship with uh, decreasing Gmax with increasing atmospheric CO2. And we see this repeatedly in all of these long ranging taxa. So uh, another way that we're getting at leaf conductance is to act, measure something uh, called vein to, to stomata distance, or DM, uh, and that can be uh, measured in these fossils that are preserved in coal balls, so they're not compressed. Uh, this is an allothopterus that you're looking at here. This relationship of vein to stomata distance has been um, defined relative to the leaf hydraulic efficiency, or K-leaf, here uh, shown uh, uh, by Bodrip et al. There are different equations for this. But the point is, is that if you were to uh, look at what the nearest living relatives would suggest, you would presume uh, K-leaf values that were somewhere on the high end of the ferns, low end of the conifers. And when you look at what we're getting as results, they are much higher values. Uh, they overlap that, those or the low end of the modern uh, angiosperms. 
So these K leaf then can be um, related to uh, maximum photosynthetic capacity or AMAX through this polynomial fit through scaling relationships to modern plants that you see here on the uh, right. Again, uh, nearest living relatives would suggest very low values of A, which is important because if you use these as a CO2 proxy uh, for modeling, you'll see in a little while, um, knowing that value is quite important. This is where our values would place uh, the A max, um, again, much higher, uh, overlapping the low end of the angiosperms. Um, another approach to, CO, to getting at CO2 assimilation here, assuming that a CO2 assimilation and AMAX are fairly similar at these very low CO2 levels, uh, is one that, that, that uh, our, my collaborator, Jenny McElwain, recently published that uh, scales G operative or G max to um, CO2 assimilation, or A, for modern plants with different vein densities. And if you superimpose on here the um, range of vein densities and Gmax for the medullosums for several different genera, um, I think you can appreciate that, yes, they have low vein densities, but given their high Gmax values, they had the potential for high uh, photosynthetic or, uh, uh, capacities and thus high net primary productivity. So we're looking at uh, a much more dynamic range, higher ranges of potentially of leaf conductance, um, of uh, CO2 assimilation. And this obviously has impact then for um, CO2 modeling, for climate modeling, hydrologic cycle, and so on. So another approach we're taking, and this is particularly important for our defining of our plant functional types, is to use uh, ecosystem process-based model modeling. Here, this is a terrestrial uh, biosphere model, biome BGC, you see it's shown schematically here. We are modifying this model uh, by one of the actual authors of the model working with us to address things like uh, plant-induced changes in irradiance, to deal with the different uh, vascular tissue, the need for mesophyll conductance in these uh, late Paleozoic plants, and to address the range of O2 to CO2 for the late Paleozoic. For each of the taxa we, or groups, we have to uh, put in a series of input variables. A couple of them, or a few of them are shown here. Uh, estimated Gmax, things like leaf nitrogen, specific leaf area, obviously uh, much more challenging to define in terms of proxies. We've been using um, C to N ratios, nearest living equivalents. You see this graph here of C to N versus specific leaf area for podocarps and tree ferns. Uh, but we also use um, other things like wheat leaf width and uh, leaf cuticle uh, thickness. Leaf boundary layer conductance, uh, also uh, uh, constrained by taxa. And lastly, we put in meteorological data that we constrain from our own published and ongoing studies of atmospheric composition and our Earth system modeling of the climate. Everything is run for 50 years to, to uh, uh, estimate values. So I'm just going to show you this one plot of these results, uh, and then later I'll turn to some water use efficiency plots. Here you're looking at um, canopy, net canopy average CO2 assimilation in red versus full maximum sunlit uh, canopy in purple uh, for the range of atmospheric uh, oxygen at the time. And the best estimate is shown here in yellow, somewhere around 9 to 16, based on two-thirds of the maximum sunlit uh, canopy. For comparison, here are the empirical values that I showed you in the last few slides. The bottom line is, is it's all suggesting a higher A values than you would see prescribed in the literature. And from our modeling, for comparison, there's the cordotalians, those seasonally dry flora, uh, the tree ferns, Picopterus, and the stem group, Walchia. So as I said, uh, the, this more dynamic range of photosynthetic capacities, gas exchange capacities, has implications for reconstructing climate. And um, included in that is reconstructing atmospheric CO2. So here you see a, uh, a CO2 um, tr uh, estimate for the 16 million years of the Pennsylvanian into the early Permian. This was uh, carried out or, ma or made based on three different proxies. Um, soil, mineral, carbonates, as well as two uh, proxies for leaf cuticles. 
the uh, yellow and black lines are lowest estimates of the data sets. And this was built over three depositional basins throughout the uh, Euro-American tropics, so there's no uh, geographic bias. Overall, um, the values show fluctuations, especially where it's more highly resolved on the range of, or magnitude of about two to 300 parts per million. And they show a rhythmicity that um, is on the 10 to the five year time scale, uh, somewhat analogous to the eccentricity scales of the Pleistocene. Values range from as low as 160 to about 600 parts per million with a period average of about 400, about double that of what is uh, typically assumed in the literature. So here I zoom in into 8 million years of this um, uh, record. I want to show you the, that in black and the black trend line are the pedogenic or soil carbonate based estimates. And it's compared here to those for two taxa of the Medulosins based on stomatal index. And you see their values uh, overlap fairly nicely. Okay, that's fine. But we all know the, the challenges with using this proxy. Uh, for your reference, the blue and white shading are these long eccentricity or 400,000 year cycles. So here you see the actual SI values uh, shown color coded by different taxa and their variants through 13 of these long eccentricity cyclothems. And the point is, is that the SI values do not show any species specificity and they do not show any geographic uh, variability. Those values are probably good. But as I said, the challenge is in how to you calibrate this to CO2. So for these values that you see here, um, we used three nearest living equivalents that you see um, uh, listed here, applied to the stomatal uh, ratio method. We all appreciate the limitations um, of this approach based on an, uh, sensitivity to environmental factors, maybe taxonomic variability, and obviously how to pick the, nearest, the appropriate nearest living equivalents. So we turn to yet another uh, fossil plant-based uh, CO2 proxy, one recently introduced um, by Franks et al. Uh, I haven't met Peter Franks, but I now know who he is. He's sitting in the, in the audience. Um, this is a mechanistic model that uh, uh, relates CO2 to uh, the <coughs> CO2 assimilation uh, to, and the total leaf conductance, as well as the intracellular to atmospheric CO2 levels. These are, uh, A is prescribed for a given taxa, total conductance, obviously from the plant traits, and CI to CA is uh, constrained using the carbon isotopes of the cuticles and its coexisting uh, marine brachiopods or foraminifera, or whatever you have to work with. Now, if it, that what you're looking at on the uh, right diagram in green are the estimates of CO2 when we use a prescribed value for all non-coniferous uh, gymnosperms. And this value prescribed by Franks et al. of six micromoles per meter squared per second. You, what you might appreciate is that these values define a very much dampened CO2 curve relative to the other two proxies. Generally the same trends, but quite dampened. And we're going to argue that this is a result of the uh, sensitivity of this mechanistic model uh, to CO2 estimates to the initial parademization. So we carried out a series of sensitivity tests um, regarding this, and you see the results of one here. This is atmospheric CO2 from this mechanistic model for a range of A values at 400 parts per million. This is the prescribed value for all non-coniferous gymnosperms versus those that we define based on plant traits, morphologies, and the ecosystem modeling. And I think you can appreciate that um, if you don't use species appropriate values that you could grossly underestimate CO2. Here on the right then are the, uh, the, the values for CO2 using the mechanistic model, but now using the, the uh, physiology that we determined. And I, I think you can see that they overlap quite nicely with the other indicators and define the same highs and lows. So given this uh, more dynamic potential range in uh, functioning of these plants and the, the uh, very good evidence for their repeated restructuring of the flora in response to climate, um, we wanted to use our ecosystem modeling to, to sort of address some of these issues of were there taxonomic differences in response to the climate that would have led to differential ecological competitiveness? And what might have been the influence on the hydrologic cycle? 
And lastly, as I said, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly mention um, a hypothesis that we're now testing further, and that is what would be the role, or is there a role, for CO2 starvation for the demise of the lycopsids before the close of the Carboniferous, and then the ultimate collapse of these forests uh, at the end Carboniferous. So here is that CO2 curve again. Um, what I want to show you here is that the eccentricity scale shifts from the wetland, the typical lycopsid forest that expanded during the glacials all through these tropical basins. Um, these were associated with these lows in CO2, each and every one of them. In contrast, the repeated restructuring to the uh, Cordatalian conifer-dominated forests during the interglacials are associated systematically with the highs in CO2. So given this, we um, turn to the modeling, as I mentioned, to look at the uh, hydrologic response to this uh, changing climate. So what you're looking at here are modeled water use efficiency for all of the floral dominance that expanded in the tropics during these glacial and interglacial periods. And the black dots are going to always be the lepidendrals or the lycopsids. And I think you can appreciate a two to six time greater water use efficiency for all of the flora that are the ones that replace the lycopsids during these shifts to drier uh, interglacials at all time scales. We can take that kind of data and further model. In this case, you're looking at the percent of the precipitation that would be as potential surface runoff. Um, again, the lepidendrals in the black dots uh, and all of the other taxa. And in particular, you can see, oh, in a particular, you can see in a, the higher values here at these lower CO2. But what one can really do with a diagram like this is to be thinking in terms of what happens if you replace a lycopsid-dominated forest or lycopsid and cordatalians like this with any grouping of these other taxa uh, during these eccentricity scale changes. Well, the answer is that you could have up to a 50% decrease in evapotranspiration and a doubling of surface runoff. And the point for us is, what does this do when you put it into Earth system models in terms of changes in weathering, in soil erosion, transport of nutrients to coastal waterways, and clearly the uh, impact on marine biosphere? So in the last few slides, I wanted to point out this issue of CO2 starvation. Here's that CO2 curve again. Um, I wanted to uh, here not talk about the eccentricity scale changes, but rather uh, the, the two major ecologic turnovers that happen. One is at the late middle Pennsylvania boundary. It is known for the loss of most of the lycopsids. And the second one is a permanent shift to seasonally dry biomes and a real retraction of the wetland uh, habitats throughout tropical Euro America. The point is, both of these occurred during these really low CO2s in both cases where they dropped below 200 parts per million. So the obvious question is, is there a role for CO2 thresholds in this? Here you see water use uh, efficiency again. Now this is the difference relative to the lepidendrals and all of the taxa have a, a water use efficiency advantage over the lepidendrals. But importantly, that water use advantage is higher during type of decreasing CO2. When CO2 is really low, these others would, would, would uh, flourish potentially. This diagram here um, is the percent the mo or the modeled operative fraction of maximum water use efficiency under these really low CO2s. And what this points out is that for the lepidendrals in purple, they would be operating potentially at 15% of their maximum water use efficiency. And this um, would, would obviously stress them under these low CO2 levels. All of the taxa are operating at less than 50% of their water use efficiency at these very low CO2 levels. And it brings in then to, uh, to, to question, is there a role for a low CO2 threshold for these two very large ecologic turnovers uh, in the Carboniferous and uh, ultimately the demise of these forests? So to conclude, um, I, I, our initial work, and we're really just in the beginning of these studies, this is a five-year uh, uh, collaborative project, 
But so far, our work suggests that um, these plants were operating at a, on a far more dynamic uh, level of uh, their physiology, and that this had um, or more dynamic than their uh, nearest living relatives, and that this had important implications for the late Paleozoic environment as well as the biosphere. And from the perspective of the climate modeling, um, we're really very interested in this, in this potential because this suggests that they could be physiologically forcing the climates and the hydrologic cycling. And if you're familiar with some of the work that's been done in model climate, in, in, in um, uh, climate models for the future, this notion of changed evapotranspiration and surface runoff can lead to huge perturbation worldwide. And lastly, again, we are, we are proposing the, the uh, uh, CO2 threshold hypothesis that may have played a role in the demise of these late Paleozoic forests uh, in conjunction with aridification. Thank you. <laughs>